So bariatric surgeries deserve their own presentation within a presentation. There is no question that this is the top cause of medical malpractice indemnities or settlements. I've done an exhaustive analysis of all the medical malpractice cases that our practice has seen. And we're so large, you know, we read six or seven million studies a year and across all 50 states. And so we have an incredible amount of data. And I can tell you, I have a whole talk on that that hopefully we'll get to uh, at the end of the month. But the bottom line is this, there are three pathologies that account for about 40% of all the emergency medical malpractice cases we've seen. And those three pathologies are aortic dissection, spinal epidural hematoma or abscess, spinal epidural fluid collections, and bariatric surgery complications, those almost always being ischemic bowel. And uh, I mentioned yesterday on that malrotation case, ischemic bowel cases are devastating from the patient outcome perspective, as well as from the medical malpractice payout perspective. Because what typically happens is the patients don't die, they lose a lot of bowel and require very expensive, long-term, in fact, lifelong care. And so that is the basis behind my preparing a bariatric surgery talk. So I have an older version of this that is on YouTube, but I've added additional cases and added this diagram as well, because one of the complaints was I'd like to talk about the uh, surgical anatomy more. And so I decided that was a reasonable request. So we'll do that now. So a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass excludes the majority of the stomach with a line of staples. So there's that stomach and the staple line, right? So you can see it just excludes all but a tiny portion of the fundus. And then what they do is they transect the small bowel and reimplant one limb into the stomach so that it is the alimentary. You can see that it's the rue limb also known as the efferent limb, and sometimes you'll see that referred to as the alimentary limb. So that is the limb that's carrying the food, and you can see that is basically a section of jejunum that's sewn into the stomach. Almost all of these are sewn into the anterior aspect of the stomach. I have seen one or two retrogastric efferent loops. But for the most part, they're going to go, come off the anterior portion of the uh, sequestered uh, segment of stomach. Okay, that said, they can then go anti-colic or retrocolic, and those are split about evenly. So if you really follow that efferent loop, you will at some point be able to tell that it goes anterior to the transverse colon, or posterior to the transverse colon. And they, again, call those anti-colic and retrocolic. There is a slight difference in the uh, incidence of obstruction. One of those has a slightly higher incidence of obstruction. The other has a slightly higher incidence of perforation or abscess. So there isn't one or the other that really uh, has fewer complications. And as far as I can tell from my research and my reading, they're about equally distributed amongst the surgical population, the anti-colic and retrocolic. Okay, so then in addition, there is what's known as the biliary pancreatic limb, also known as the afferent limb. And so they essentially leave the proximal bowel, the duodenum and proximal jejunum intact to transmit the biliary and pancreatic juices necessary for digestion. So they will create an anastomosis there between the afferent and efferent loops so that everything comes together. So there are afferent loop complications as well. Obviously with an anastomosis, uh, there is the potential for obstruction, intussusception, et cetera. So we'll get into all of those. So the complications we'll be looking at, 
obstruction. Certainly that is high on the list. Um, these surgeries disrupt the normal peritoneal reflections, allow greater mobility for all the bowel throughout the peritoneum, and that leads to the potential for obstruction, internal hernias specifically. By the way, an internal hernia associated with bariatric surgery is known as a Peterson hernia. I actually didn't know that. Neither did one of our radiologists who in a deposition was uh, pimped on that issue. So now you're ready for a deposition knowing that they're called Peterson hernias. Uh, next, intussusception. Certainly at anastomotic sites, you can get dilation and that predisposes people to intussusceptions. Staple line dehiscence, that staple line you saw in the gastric fundus, it can be disrupted and then food and secretions are allowed to pass from the smaller sequestered portion of the stomach into the larger native stomach. Ulceration, certainly we see this mostly in the efferent loop, uh, probably because of gastric acid being relatively undiluted and passing into a jejunal loop of bowel that's not necessarily uh, histologically designed to handle it. Ischemia, again, the disruption of normal peritoneal reflections allows greater mobility, and with internal hernias, of course, come vascular compromise as well. Perforation, uh, right up there with ulceration in terms of the ability of that proximal uh, efferent loop to handle gastric acid. Afferent loop syndrome, again, that afferent loop can become obstructed, can become ischemic, just like any segment of bowel, and that leads to uh, significant complications. All right, and so all of this is to say I have one basic rule about bariatric surgery patients, and it is this. All CT studies of bariatric surgery patients should be performed with oral and intravenous contrast. Oftentimes we're late on the scene, we get a non-contrast study. As soon as you see those bariatric clips, you make note of it in your report and you call the referring clinician and say, this is an incomplete evaluation. I stand by that. In uh, many of these cases, you'll see a role for either oral or IV contrast. And I hope that uh, all of these cases presented to you will make it clear that this is a good rule to stand by. All right, so on to our first case. This one is a, uh, a case of obstruction. You can see there is clear small bowel dilation here and a very nice focal transition, right? As the bowel is coming across from the right to the patient left, there is a marked caliber transition consistent with an obstruction. So there are the staples. You know, we had a medical malpractice case where the radiologist involved said, well, there was no mention in the clinical history of this patient having a history of bariatric surgery. Well, come on, uh, that staple line is quite evident and it's immediately apparent as you start scrolling through an abdomen pelvis CT and you should make note of it right away because this patient is at risk for all kinds of complications as previously noted. So here's a very good view of that caliber transition right there. And it's quite remote from the actual operative site. So do make note of that. These complications can affect the patient's bowel anywhere in the peritoneum. So there's a nice internal hernia, probably an adhesion or band causing that. So that is a simple small bowel obstruction. All right, this is a contrasted study with a small bowel obstruction, very similar to the previous, but just a gorgeous depiction of a caliber transition. And the contrast really brings that out by dilating up the proximal bowel. The other interesting thing about this is that there is a little bit of contrast in the decompressed distal small bowel. So that enables you to say, this is actually not a complete bowel obstruction. Certainly it's a high grade, but incomplete small bowel obstruction because it is allowing a tiny bit of contrast through. So the oral contrast is helping us there as well. Okay, again, there is that staple line. Now this patient also has staple line dehiscence and I'm sorry I didn't note that um, in the, slides, but you see how there's contrast in the native stomach, 
and the duodenum and proximal uh, jejunum. So that is a sign of staple line dehiscence as well as this patient having an obstruction. We'll see a few more cases of that. And again, there's that caliber transition right as you go from the dilated contrast containing bowel loop right there. And then again, contrast in the more distal small bowel. So that is a gastric bypass with small bowel obstruction, but also note there was contrast in that proximal gut, meaning there is staple line dehiscence. We'll see a few more subtle ones. This is a gastric bypass with an intussusception, and this looks like just any other intussusception. You can see a bowel loop and mesenteric fat and vessels within a larger dilated bowel loop. And again, uh, people with anastomoses have a tendency to dilate up at the anastomotic site, and that does predispose you to intussusception. So you can see that fat within the gut lumen, always a good sign. Uh, to indicate the presence of an intussusception. Obviously, not a good sign from the patient perspective. All right, so that is a gastric bypass with intussusception. You can see the dilated bowel there at the anastomosis, setting this patient up for that phenomenon. All right, this is a straightforward staple line dehiscence. It's a little more subtle because there's less contrast flowing in uh, to that native gut lumen. But you can see the staple line, and then there is the contrast within the native gastric fundus where it should not be, right? It should go through that sequestered portion uh, in the smaller, more medial segment of the gastric fundus and then flow straight into the efferent loop. So you can see there's just a little contrast in that native stomach, but that is enough to say this is a staple line dehiscence. Now that in and of itself may not cause terrible problems, but it does suggest a weakening of the staple line. And in most cases, they're going to want to know about this and may want to actually revise it. All right, that is a staple line dehiscence. All right, and this is one with staple line dehiscence, but also an ulcer involving the efferent loop. So again, we see that contrast within the native gastric fundus telling you that there is a dehiscence of the staple line. And then here, there's contrast that's also in the excluded gastric body. There, now this is the one example of a retrogastric efferent loop that I have, and look how thick-walled and fuzzy that is. You may not actually see the ulceration, but it's reasonable to say this is an ulceration or possibly ischemia involving the efferent loop. And note again, that is retrogastric, uh, and this one ultimately is retrocolic as well. That's a relatively unusual location for that efferent loop. So it goes down behind the stomach right there. So very thick-walled, uh, luminal narrowing, suggesting that there is ulceration or ischemia involving that efferent loop right there. All right, and again, staple line dehiscence uh, denoted by that uh, collection of contrast in the native stomach. All right, this is another staple line dehiscence. So this should really start striking your eye, right? When you see a big collection of contrast in that native fundus, know right away there's a problem. There is also contrast in this splenic abscess. So you can, with manipulation of the stomach, or for that matter, the splenic flexure of the colon, develop these subcapsular fluid collections. It's due to traction on the leonogastric ligament or the leonocolic ligament you actually see subcapsular splenic hematomas as a complication of colonoscopy frequently. When they do that splenic flexure bend, they pull on, uh, on the leonocolic ligament and separate the capsule from the spleen itself. So probably some level of manipulation resulted in a subcapsular fluid collection, and there is a communication actually between the proper channel, the efferent loop, uh, 
and the spleen. You saw that little line of contrast connecting the two. So in that situation, you can be pretty sure that that is a super infected, uh, thus subcapsular splenic abscess. And there's that contrast line extending over the spleen from the stomach, right? Most likely related to the manipulation of the stomach during this procedure. So an interesting case of staple line dehiscence, but also with a splenic abscess. All right, on to a few perforations. This is a non-contrast scan, which of course is suboptimal, but you can see right there, there is gas, extra luminal gas beyond the confines of this manipulated stomach. And you can see plenty of stranding there as well. So that's a pretty straightforward case of just gas beyond the confines of the gastrointestinal tract. And there is that staple line and efferent loop. This one actually may not be an efferent loop. This is probably an older case where they just stapled the stomach. You can see that uh, still is in communication. So the older versions of this, they just stapled the stomach and they didn't reroute the small bowel. All right, so that is a gastric bypass with perforation. Okay, here is a more normal uh, version of this, a more frequent scenario. In fact, I had to choose between three, four, maybe even five cases of this exact location where that efferent loop is coming out. It's exposed to more gastric acid than it is designed to handle. And so it's a fairly common location for ulceration and perforation. So you can see there is a collection of extra luminal gas and contrast here. And it's right in the origins there of the efferent loop. And you can see there's a small bowel wall thickening. As we discussed earlier, you get gastric acid in the peritoneum and all of the bowel loops, whether or not they're involved in the primary pathologic process, will tend to become thick walled and enhancing. So there is that collection of contrast and gas denoting a perforation. So that's a gastric bypass with perforation. Mm -hmm. 